Today in Canadian history for September the 6th, I'm Joe Barima. Walk into any house in Canada. I recommend, of course, that you knock or maybe ring the doorbell first. But walk into any house and take a look at the bookshelf. It could be a house in Yellowknife or a small house in a coastal town in Nova Scotia. Or maybe a house next to a park in Vancouver. Odds are, nestled next to a copy of the hockey sweater or a thick stack of Pierre Burton standards, you'll find an edition of the Canadian Encyclopedia. Back in 1985, the first edition of the Encyclopedia was launched on this day at the Citadel Theatre in Edmonton, Alberta. The collection has become the guide to Canada, a window into the lives of Canadians and the communities we call home. I spoke with James H. Marsh, the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia. Back in 1980, he was brought on by publisher Mel Herdig to tackle this little project he had been working on. Mel came across the idea that um, he tells the story that he was in um, a, uh, a library waiting to give a speech and walked around and saw the American uh, resources and uh, searched in vain for a, a, a Canadian a general resource and got the idea that he would try to make a Canadian encyclopedia. So the idea sprang solely out of Mel Herdig's mind, but it was, and this makes it a great Alberta story, because you know Mel was a nationalist, liberal, uh, almost radical thinker, uh, but he never could have done the project without the support of the conservative premier of the time, Peter Lougheed, who saw a great confluence of interest on Alberta's 75th anniversary to fund Mel to create uh, a resource for all Canadians. Because I, th- you know, Peter, even though he was the greatest defender of Alberta and its mineral rights and so on, was also a very, and still is, a very strong Canadian nationalist. And so there was this marvelous coming together of uh, two sides of the political spectrum to create and then fund the idea of a Canadian encyclopedia. One of the challenge, challenges, actually, that we've had with our series is that the history of Canada, it means so many different things to, to, to Canadians. How do you tackle the history of a country that is just so diverse? Uh, one of the, that was one of the driving forces behind having so many people write it. So if you were to just go to a bunch of academics in Ontario and have them write the history of Canada, it would be quite different from what we did, and that is to have historians uh, focusing on history again from every province and from the territories write their own history, write their local history. Now, I wouldn't always agree with the overall history of the country or a central narrative as, you know, and I think having a central narrative about a country that is so diverse as Canada is just uh, ephemera. I don't believe that such a thing can really exist, but a kind of central narrative colored by all the the local interpretations and the regional aspects to it really is what uh, defines Canada, in my opinion. And even though on separate, like single articles, like an article on federalism, when there's so many different views of it, I found that finding an author who could cover those different views, but then also balance it with another article that might be on provincial rights, uh, you know, one article on Canadian nationalism balanced by an article on French Canadian nationalism, uh, articles on regionalism and those sorts of things, so that somebody can dip into it, not only find their own point of view, but also find other points of view. And, uh, you know, to me, that's the real uh, strength of our encyclopedia. The first edition of the Canadian Encyclopedia was a massive communal effort. A group of 300 consultants from different areas helped James find over 3,500 people to write the 3.5 million word collection. This is more contributors than Encyclopedia Britannica, and that collection sat at 50 million words. And Canadians ate up every word of the first edition. It was incredible. We printed 150,000 sets of that encyclopedia in September of 1985, and sold them out within a few weeks. 
uh, you have to understand that in Canada, a bestseller is like 5,000, and, and a work of a reference work or a history book that would sell a thousand copies would be unusual in Canada. So the response was incredible. We had at least uh, 200 and some odd reviews in the newspapers and magazines and television and radio, and I did a cross-country tour, and so did Mel Hurdig. And I would say, with the exception of one or two, the reviews were just raving about um, this great work and it people the response was really that yeah it's a great reference work you can look things up but it's a lot more than that it kind of sums up our country it's kind of the ident- canadian identity and all its uh, uh, multiple uh, perspectives and i think that's how it was received and, and in many ways still is i think some of the things that stand out to me okay are the incredible original contributions that Canadians have made to, you know, internationally. And I don't know how to put this, but how many originals, we're thought of as being this kind of, you know, nice, boring people. But every time you look at, you know, Leonard Cohen and Marshall McLuhan and Glenn Gould and Katie Lang and and even through some of the pop music groups that you see now, that... We always seem to be able to add a little edge to uh, to these these things. Look at Frank Geary, the great architect, and how he's he's a Canadian and how he's changed things internationally. That surprises me more than anything because I was brought up as most Canadians are to think that you know that uh, most of the great accomplishments are elsewhere. But so the that really that first of all that really stands out to me. I just encourage people uh, to learn about their country and, above all, to learn about other parts of their country. I often find that Canadians, whenever I travel across the country, they primarily will say to me, yeah, well, you covered this about my area, but you didn't say this and this, and I appreciate that. But I also like to say to them, uh, what else have you learned about Canada? If you're a Quebecer, have you learned about Alberta? And if you're an Alberta, Albertan, have, what have you learned about Quebec? And I think that, uh, you know, in that way, we can be a great tool to unify the country. As always, today is a day full of Canadian history. René Le Cavier passed away in Montreal on this day back in 1999. He was the first commentator for the French language version of Hockey Night in Canada and was known as the voice of hockey for many Montreal Canadian fans. The Crow's Nest Pass Agreement was signed on this day back in 1897. The agreement meant that the CPR was to be given cash to reduce rates on grain and flour shipments. On this day back in 1990, the New Democrats were elected in Ontario making Bob Ray the first NDP Premier in the province's history. And, as always, on this day, we aired this episode of Today in Canadian History. Today in Canadian History is produced by CJSW 90.9 FM in Calgary. For more information on the series, join our Facebook page and visit our website at cjsw.com slash History. What would you like to see if flipping through an encyclopedia or flipping through a reference or on a website, what would you like to see listed for the Canadian encyclopedia? How would you like to see it described? I would love for people to see it and to describe it as probably the greatest portrait of this country that was ever drawn and the greatest definition of our identity. Mm